I have 31 on my watch, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I do have an announcement before our first song. Um, Joe Bob Brown's nephew, Kenny Brown, was taken to the hospital this morning, um, and the family's asking for prayers. So we want to make sure that we remember Kenny Brown um, and the doctors that are seeing him in our prayers today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, singing Be Happy, if you will be standing for this song. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole way through, there's a silver light that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see, my friend, trust in His promises.
Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to be here again today to worship you. Um, God, I ask that the things that we do here, the things that we teach, the ministries that we have, the outreach that we are trying to trying to complete and achieve, that they're all in accordance with your word. Uh, Father, we're thankful that we have the space and freedom to, to worship without fear of persecution. Uh, God, we know that that is not a guarantee in all parts of our world. Uh, Father, we're mindful of people in our world who are, who are dealing with difficulty, uh, with conflicts of war in the Middle East, uh, things that are going on in other countries. Uh, Father, I ask that you be with those people and keep them safe, especially those of us who have uh, family or related persons or we know people who are being affected by that conflict. Uh, Father, we're mindful of things that are going on here at home that need our attention, that need our prayer, that need your, your guidance and your providence. Uh, Father, please be with those who are sick, who are hurting, who have lost loved ones recently, who are lonely, who don't know you, and please help us to be here for them to uh, fulfill their needs and reach out to them. Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Please continue to bless our church and the things that we try to accomplish, and these things I pray for in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Day by day. Day.
Well, good evening, everybody. I'm a bit excited. I think we had a good start to our leadership class, and you know, it's always encouraging when you get brethren together and they all participate together and learn from each other, and it just, that's what fellowship is about, you know, sharing, so it's what we do. Uh, we're going to be looking at the sixth of the eight Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. This one deals with pure in heart, and it's very simple. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I, I don't, you know, when you talk about having favorite Beatitudes, it's really hard for me, because usually I really like the one I'm studying at the time, you know, as I go through them. It's like, you ask me, what's your favorite book in the Bible? As well, the one I'm studying right now, that's my favorite book because I'm enjoying it so much. But anyway, there's something to me that's winsome about this one. And at the same time that it's simple, it's also very deep in what it's asking for. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, this particular one really challenges our integrity, the integrity of our hearts, what our focus is, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, James who, by the way, probably wrote the very first epistle, in, in the oldest epistle in our, in our New Testaments. He wrote in James chapter 1 and verses 5 through 8 these words. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, the word double-minded is just the opposite of the word being pure in heart, if you think of pure in heart as being in terms of integrity. Because the idea of the double-minded man is that he lacks integrity. And why is that? Well, his heart is not committed to just one thing overall. And so that lack of commitment really makes his life unstable. You, you find him going to and fro from one thing to the next. And in the end, he doesn't seem to really accomplish much. Because his heart is divided as to where it wants to place its loyalty and what it wants to accomplish. Well, the same holds true in our spiritual life as well. So to be spiritually stable... And to receive the reward of a stable life, we're going to have to choose what we are going to follow. And then we're going to have to stay true to it. And this is why Jesus, or what Jesus means when he talks about overall what it means to be pure in heart. And so I want us to understand how eternally important it is for us to choose to follow God. And I want to talk with you about two points. And we're following the same pattern with each of these. You're going to recognize these. We're going to break the verse in half. We're going to talk, first of all, what does it mean to be of a pure in heart? So blessed are the pure in heart. But then secondly, what does it mean to see God? What does it mean to see God? And so we'll talk about those things. Anyway, number one, blessed are the pure in heart. Now, I want you to know, if we're going to better develop this point, let's first of all be clear about what we mean when we talk about the word heart. Because a man's heart is important in so many ways in the Bible. For example, number one, in the Bible, the heart is really the center of your personality, of your entire personality. Now, you could, if you were to be a scholar in the Old and New Testaments, the word that we have translated as heart is really an English adaptation. Because in the Greek, it really refers to your gut. We don't think about our emotions coming from our gut or, our, you know, those kinds of things. We think of it uh, in our society, heart is the right word. And so it's right that the English uh, translators did it that way. But I bring this up because if you'll think about it for a minute, when you get upset or excited, what happens down here? <laughs> you feel it here, right? I mean, you know, something happens here, <laughs> okay? And so when the Greeks talked about this, you know, you're affected here, <laughs> okay? And they saw that as the center. But English, we, we do heart, okay? And this becomes the center of light. And so on the negative side of things, we find the Bible tells us that the heart 
from the heart is where sin issues. It's where it comes from. Uh, give you an example. Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20. Very familiar text. It says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. And Jesus, of course, is telling that on the occasion when his disciples were being criticized because they hadn't washed their hands before they ate, according to the ceremony uh, of the Jews. In Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, whoops, went ahead. Let me go back. On Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And again, Jeremiah is trying to point out that if we just rely upon our desires, our intellect, our thinking alone, and not rely on God, we're not really going to serve God. We're going to serve ourselves. And so again, from the heart, these things happen, he says. Now, but on the positive side, a pure heart is indispensable. If you and I are going to see God, we've got to have a pure heart. And we want to talk about that. You know, there's so many verses I want to read a few with you. This idea that Jesus has here is really based in Old Testament teaching, and a lot of it comes from the Psalms. So I want to share a few with you. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5, for example. It says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Uh, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Another text out of Psalm 73 and verse 1. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And then from the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, strive for peace with everyone, for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now again, notice the word holiness as needful to see the Lord. And again, holiness is being committed to God's way of life, the, the purity of life that uh, holiness requires. First John, th whoops, First John 3 and verse 3, uh, and everyone th who thus uh, hopes in himself purifies himself as he is pure. Again, the idea of purifying and being pure. And of course, we have here Matthew 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, this tells us we've got a couple of sides here, and those sides remind us that purity of heart is as much about what we avoid as about what we do. And they go together. Being focused on serving God uh, goes beyond just recognizing the spiritual needs of those around us. That's where mercy comes in. But pure of heart goes beyond just that. It says that service requires... Uh, I'm sorry... We, we need to serve God and avoid hypocrisy if we're going to be pure in heart. So yes, be concerned for others around us. That's part of being merciful from the previous verse. But serve God and also avoid hypocrisy. Don't be a double-minded man, you might say. Something else. Additionally, emphasizing the heart makes us realize that living in the kingdom is not just about outward conformity uh, to rules. You know, even obedience needs to come from the heart. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be sincere. It needs to be authentic. That motivation, it's not just a check mark of, of an obedience box. And, or as Jesus would point out later, trying to uh, have the positive assessment of other people like in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 1 through 24, when he talked about the Pharisees being motivated to do their actions because they wanted to be noticed by other people. If you're going to be pure in heart, even obedience means uh, comes from a genuine source. It's not just an outward performance. A pure heart seeks only the praise and the reward that we're going to get from God. Well, what does he mean when he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Again, I would challenge you to know that Jesus' teaching on purity of heart is also rooted in the Old Testament. And let me list these verses for you. I, I, I 
hate to read a bunch of verses, but I'm going to. <laughs> Psalms chapter 18, verse 20, and then verse 24. There it says, The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. And then verse 24, So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. And again, the cleanness of hands refers to what? What you do. And God is watching and he's looking. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who do right things, you might say. And then Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5, this is another part of the, I quoted from uh, earlier. He says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? And again, the answer is, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not uh, swear deceitfully, he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. One more, Psalm 51. And you know the background to this one. This one is David's prayer shortly after Nathan had exposed him in the adultery and in the murder of uh, Bathsheba's husband, uh, Uriah the Hittite. And Nathan confronted him. And God, you know, David, of course, now realizes fully what he's done. I think he realized at the time, but the shock of it all just finally hits him, I guess, what he's losing here. And so he writes the 51st Psalm in response to that. Verse 6 says, Behold, you delight in the truth, in the inward being. You see, if you look at David, he knew adultery and murder were both wrong. He knew that already intellectually. But now, having been confronted and realizing the truth about himself, you delight in the truth in the inward being, not just an intellectual acknowledgement of something, but an intellectual acknowledgement all the way in the heart. Okay? And you teach me wisdom in the uh, secret heart. Verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Again, David knew that he is wrong, and he knew he had been forgiven, but at the same time, he also needed to clean up his act, and that's exactly what he prays for. Clean, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then lastly, the 73rd Psalm in verse 1. Again, we read it earlier. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now again, all that goes back to this idea that we're saying here, that Jesus borrows this idea, as he does many things from the Old Testament, and gives it a much fuller and richer meaning. The word pure is from the Greek word katharos, from which we get our English word catharsis which we understand means to cleanse or to purge. Now, in its noun form, katharos means to clean literally or figuratively or to clear or to be innocent or pure. But the adjective form of the word, the descriptive form, also means clean or pure, but even more, it means unsoiled or unalloyed. In other words, there's, it's not divided. It is a pure product. It, there's no pollution in it, you see. And so the purity of heart in this context emphasizes integrity. That is a singleness of purpose and uh, of focus in one's life. And so to limit purity of heart to just inward purity would be a mistake because the pure in heart are people who are not divided in their loyalties. They're only committed to one thing. You know, if you go and study uh, the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, there is a statement there where it talks about the Lord is one, the Lord, uh, the Lord is our God, and the Lord is one. And scholars are divided. Is this talking about monotheism? Meaning that there is only one God, and certainly there is truth in that. Because if you look at the other nations when, uh, that were surrounding Israel as they're about to enter the promised land, they had many different gods, false gods. And very, you know, it could very possibly be that that means one God. But scholars also recognize the fact that what it's saying is a pledge of allegiance. We only have one God. The Lord God is one. That is our God, the only God. We are going to be loyal to him. And so again, the purity of focus is the idea there. 
You see, when a person who is pure in heart and not divided in his loyalties, his heart is unmixed with anything devious. He doesn't have ulterior or base motives. He has no guile or hypocrisy in him. Again, if you go back to the 24th Psalm, the person with clean hands and a pure heart is the one who does not lift up his soul to what is false. That would be an idol and does not swear deceitfully. That's out of 24 and verse 4. And so again, it's a reference to sincerity, that he truly is committed to this cause. His relationship with God and man is free from falsehood, and it's transparent. What, he, what you see is what you get, you know? Because that's how he portrays himself. Purity of heart. He shows you exactly what he is. He walks in integrity. And also purity of heart is a guide for the merciful. You know, we have to realize something. When you show mercy to others, there's a very great temptation. And that temptation is in showing mercy to others is to begin overlooking their sins. Because we're trying to be merciful. And so our compassion for what they are becomes confused with tolerating sinful behavior and treating it with, you know, sly smile and a wink and a nudge kind of a thing because we think we're being merciful. Purity of heart doesn't allow for that. You know, we tell ourselves in this case, see how understanding and merciful and forgiving I am? Well, not really. You know, there's a case in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, where a brother is living with his father's wife. And you'll notice that Paul says, you know, not even the Gentiles, that is, the non-Christians in the very city in which you live, of Corinth, would do what you're doing, would allow that to go on, okay? So here are these pagans. Now, if you know anything about Corinth, Corinth was a wild town. <laughs> it did not have a good reputation. If you wanted to insult somebody in the first century in, in, among the Roman Empire, you called them a Corinthian because they were looked upon as just being low people, okay? And Paul's saying, here you got the city with these low standards of morality, and here you have a brother who's living in a way that not even they would think is acceptable, and you're acting like that's all right? You're patting yourself on the back and saying, what? Oh, look at us, see how merciful we are, how forgiving we are? And Paul's point is, don't you realize your brother is going to hell? And you're patting yourself on the back thinking you're being merciful because you're not confronting him over behavior that's obviously wrong? He says, no, you've got to purify yourselves. And he goes on and talks about that. And see, being pure of heart is the balance to being merciful because when we want to be merciful to others, we, we do. We, we want to help them. We want to show them mercy. <laughs> We, we see them in need of something. And if we're not careful and not have it balanced with pureness of heart, we can start overlooking their sin because we think we're helping them. You see, that we cannot do because in doing that, we're really defeating the entire point of living in the kingdom of God. You know, you can look at Jesus' own example he was around sinners on a regular daily basis. People were coming to him, and it's amazing to me. You know, you, you have the, the publicans, the tax collectors who were despised. You had prostitutes. You had people who were called sinners. You had common people all coming to Jesus. And he knew they were sinners, and he loved them, and they knew he loved them. But you also notice that with Jesus, he never once made light of or excused their spiritual conditions. He didn't. He cared about them, but he also knew that they were sinners, and that's something they needed to solve. And because he genuinely cared about them, and they knew it, he was willing to tell them what they needed to do to be right with God, too. You know, as somebody who lives in the kingdom, we have to follow Jesus' example as well. That brings us to our second point, for they shall see God. In the Old Testament, and specifically again in the Psalms, and if you look in the book of the major prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, 
seeing God conveyed a lot of different ideas. Now, I'm going to go back even further than just those. But if you look at some of the examples, number one, you find out it echoes the Garden of Eden. You remember there in Genesis chapter 3, of course, Adam and Eve have sinned. But you notice in verse 8 it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, I point that out because think about that. Here they are in the Garden of Eden, and God literally comes down and walks in the garden. And this seems to be something he was doing on a regular basis. He was having fellowship with them directly. And they got to see God directly up until this point. <laughs> because it says the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And again, I don't know the... <laughs> Did they really think they were hiding from God? <laughs> anyway, but the idea here is seeing God directly was the idea of having fellowship with him. And then when you go to the other hand, seeing God could be a very dangerous thing. You remember Moses was invited to go up on uh, the Mount, Mount Sinai, but he was not allowed to see God's face because if he saw God's face, what was going to happen? He would die. And so there in Exodus chapter 33, verses 20 through 23, we read this. It says, But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. And so seeing God when we're not ready can be a very dangerous thing, can't it? <laughs> you can lose your life over it. But if we're going to get to Jesus' point here about seeing God, seeing God or seeing God's face was connected to how God reacted to us and not only reacted to us as individuals, but also how he reacted to, to nations who were involved. And to just give you some ideas, if God hid his face then blessings were denied and God was angry and God was opposed to you. And again, let me give you a couple of examples about that. I borrowed from uh, the psalm again. Psalm 34 and verse 16. He says, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Notice, the face of the Lord, you, he's turned his face away from you. You cannot see him. You can't see his face. And then Isaiah 54 and verse 8. He says, in overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I'll have a compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And so again, speaking to the nation of Judah, and this is shortly after the Assyrian situation, well, this is getting into later in the chapter, this whole different story, but I hid my face from you in my anger. Okay, God had turned away from giving blessings. And then Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Probably a passage that's well known. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. When God turns his face away, it's a sign of God's disapproval. That he's no longer in agreement with what you're doing. And a matter of fact, may be angry and may be standing in judgment against you. But on the other hand, if God's face is turned toward you, then it's good news. You are blessed and God works with you and God works for you and you have fellowship together. And so again, we share some text. Psalm 44, verses 1 through 3. It says, O oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You, with your own hands, drove out the nations, but them you planted, you afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For, now, uh, for not by their own sword did they win the land, and nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face for you delighted in them. Now, this is the psalmist giving a poetical description of the people occupying the land and basically saying that the reason they did that is because God was on their side. God's face was turned towards them, the light of God's face, as he says in verse 3. 
Isaiah chapter 80, I'm sorry, Psalm 80 and verse 3 says, Restore me, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Again, I want to see your face shine, the blessings that come from you. And finally, Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 29 says, And I will not hide my face anymore from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. You see, by this time in the book of Ezekiel, Jerusalem has already fallen and Judah has fallen as well and the rest of the people who are going into captivity are gone. And Isaiah is recommissioned in chapter 37 and now his message is you need to give hope to the people because I'm eventually going to bring them back out of captivity. And so here is part of the message that Isaiah gives from God. I will not hide my face anymore from them. I will turn my face towards them, you see when I pour out my spirit upon the house of of Israel, declares the Lord. And so to see God meant God was on your side and you again had fellowship. Now, here's why Jesus then says the pure of heart will see God. You know, it seems that, again, this part of the beatitude is also drawn out of the the 24th Psalm in verses 3 through 6. And I'm not going to reread it again, but it's God blesses the pure in heart and rewards them with righteousness. That is a right standing before them. If you add it in, uh, yeah, verse 6 says, Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Again, giving them a right standing is the conclusion of that psalm. But there's a future reward. That not only is God on your side when you practice purity of heart here, but God is on your side in eternity. Uh, I love the book of Revelation. <laughs> I say that knowing what I said earlier. But I love the descriptiveness of it. And especially when you get to chapters 20 and 21 and 22, when God begins describing that city, and in particular in chapter 21, in verses 1 through 4, I want you to notice who is the center of this new Jerusalem He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be Uh, with them and as their God he will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away you see in that new Jerusalem what makes it so wonderful is we see the face of God he is the very presence there he even acts to wipe the tears away from our eyes he is the God who is at the very center of the, of the city and we dwell with him there. Seeing God is eternal life is another part of it. Let me conclude this lesson this way. In the magazine guidepost, uh, we read this story. When I was a boy, my father, a baker, introduced me to the wonders of song. Tenor Luciano Pavarotti relates... He, meaning his father, he urged me to work very hard to develop my voice. Arrigo Pola, a professional tenor in my hometown of Modena, uh, Italy, took me as a pupil. He says, I also enrolled in teacher's college. On graduating, I asked my father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? And apparently his father was wise. He says, Luciano, his father replied, If you try to sit on two chairs, you'll fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. And Pavarotti says this, he says, I chose. It took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven to reach the Metropolitan Opera. And now I think whether it's laying bricks or writing a book, whatever we choose, We should give ourselves to it. Commitment, that's the key. Choose one chair. To be pure of heart 
means we have to make a choice regarding the direction and the commitment of our lives. And also it means choosing God's way. It means that we get to see God's face in this life and in the, ble- uh, the life to come and all the blessings that go with it. So brethren, I'd like to encourage you tonight, make a choice. Be pure of heart. Commit yourself to serving God and everything else will flow from that. And tonight, if you are not a Christian, we'd like to talk with you about the blessings that you can have, not only in being pure in heart, but also in being a Christian as a starting place. I don't even know where to start to tell you that. We would love to sit down with God's Word tonight and just show you what it would mean and show you how you can be a Christian this very evening. And like I said this morning and all the invitations, if you're ready to be baptized, we're ready to help you with that too. And tonight, if you are a Christian and you need the prayers of the church, then please come as we stand and sing the song of invitation.
so thankful for this day we've had to come and spend in worship and trying to express our honor and love for you. So Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we all strive for the purity we know you want us to have. We ask that you watch over us, that you will heal the sick of our number, that you'll help them get back to their health, to be your will. You'll bring us back at the next point in time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.